Good morning. It is Sunday, July 25th. And I'm Pastor Mark Dilley of West Valley Grace Fellowship. I pray the message this morning will be used to strengthen you in your faith and encourage you in your walk with our Savior and Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. You probably noticed now you have the right handout. It's just got the wrong date on it. <laughs> Galatians chapter 2 verses 7 through 10 we're talking about this uh, meeting between Paul and the apostles and the elders and those of importance in Jerusalem it's often called the Jerusalem council and so let's uh, begin with Galatians chapter 2 and verse 7 on the contrary they saw that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, just as Peter to the Jews. Now, we talked about that last week. We're not going to talk about it this week. It was the gospel of the uncircumcision. The gospel of the uncircumcision was committed to Paul, and the gospel of the circumcision was committed to Peter. Verse 8, For God, who was at work in the ministry of Peter as an apostle to the Jews, was also at work in my ministry as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Peter, and John, those reputed to be pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace that was given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the Jews. All they asked was that we should be continue to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the revelation you've left us. We thank you for the privilege of being called your children through faith in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the great redemption that we have in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. And so we gather in his name to worship you in spirit and in truth. And so we ask that your spirit would guide and direct my thoughts, the meditations of my heart, and the words of my lips, and that the hearers would hear what you would have them know today. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. And I would like to focus in on Galatians 2.10. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. The outcome of this conference in Galatians chapter 2 ended with this. They had accepted Paul's ministry, and now they were adding this one final and sole request to indicate that they had resigned themselves, I believe, to the ministry and the message of Paul, to relinquish all ideas of annexing Paul's ministry and his gospel into their ministry and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the kingdom or prophetic revelation. And so Paul and his converts Paul would not allow them to be brought under the umbrella of Judaism. And I think it's important for us today to understand that this distinctive revelation given to the Apostle Paul is apart and different and distinct from what the Lord Jesus Christ taught when he was here on earth. And so... There is another narrative, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but not only here in Galatians 2, but also in Acts chapter 15, there is a, another council that sounds very similar to this meeting. But I'm of the opinion that it is not the same meeting. Uh, it's a little bit different in what it expresses, but I think it also has some things that are just not compatible. 
And so I tend to believe that it's two separate meetings. And I would like to talk about this Acts 15 council for a second. So in the Acts 15 account, the apostles and the elders seem convinced to some degree that the Gentile converts are legitimate. But they would still desire to assert a little control over these Gentile believers. And so James noticed that it is not Peter that issues this judgment, which I think is a, a significant point to recognize, that Peter, who had entrusted to him the keys to the kingdom, the Peter who is recognized by many religions, <clears throat> many sects of Christianity, maybe I should say, as the first pope or the first leader of the church or this church age like we talked about today but that's just not the case and so in acts 15 verses 19 and 20 we're going to discuss what they recommended or to be done and so james is speaking and he says this it is my judgment therefore that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to, and he gives four things, to abstain from food polluted by idols. And then I've added abstain in each one, but to abstain from sexual immorality, to abstain from meat, of strangled animals and four abstain from blood so do you see that the outcome of this council sounds drastically different from just giving to the poor which Paul was already favorably to do so seems like there's some different understanding here uh, now I can certainly understand why James would give this judgment because if we look in the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 4, it says, But you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. If you strangled something, it wouldn't shed its blood. And so if you cooked it without bleeding it, it would still have its lifeblood in it. In Genesis chapter 7 and verse 26 and 27, And wherever you live, you must not eat the blood of any bird or animal. If anyone eats blood, that person must be cut off from his people. And then Leviticus 17, 13 and 14. Any Israelite or any alien living among you who hunts any animal or bird that, must, that may be eaten must drain out the blood and cover it with the earth because the life of every creature is its blood. That is why I have said to the Israelites, you must not eat the blood of any creature because the life of every creature is its blood. Anyone who eats it must be cut off. And so that is some of the background, I think, for James's issuing this judgment. But in the gospel of the grace of God, I believe we are commanded to obey uh, only one of these four things that he makes a judgment against. In 1 Corinthians 6, 18, the apostle Paul says, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. And so it's important, I think, to understand that in the gospel of the grace of God, we're not under law. But that doesn't mean that we have not been given commandments to obey. And so we do have a choice, so to speak, in the things that we do. But they should be based on scripture. And so let's look about what Paul says about eating foods in 1 Corinthians 8, verses 4 through 9. 
because this was a, 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 an issue in the early church. We don't have this issue much today, but yet it still is a little bit of an issue. When I was growing up, we couldn't eat meat on Fridays. <laughs> well, when I was growing up, there were times when we were supposed to give up foods and behaviors for Lent. A lot of different activities, which uh, I never really truly understood, but I did them. But anyway, here in 1 Corinthians 8, beginning with verse 4, Paul said, because the problem was there were people saying, oh, you shouldn't eat that. If you bought it in the marketplace, it was offered to an idol, something like that. So then, about eating food, sacrifice to idols. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and there is no God but one. And so the fact that they had offered that to an idol was irrelevant because that idol didn't even exist. There is no God, but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things come and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. Do you notice there, because uh, there are many people today that profess to be children of God in a general <coughs> term, uh, that embrace multi-gods. Uh, I don't even know quite the name, the Baha'i religion or something has many different gods in it. And Jesus Christ is recognized as one of those. The Bible will not tolerate but one God that exists in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so here again, Paul is identifying the Lord Jesus Christ with the one true God, and that Jesus Christ was the creator that all things came by. And Jesus Christ, you know, they say, well, he was a good man. He was a prophet of God. But he wasn't God. Well, to deny the Godship of the Lord Jesus Christ is to deny him. Because he, express, he accepts worship. He accepts the description of him. And the Bible declares him to be God. And so uh, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That very much limits access to God through Jesus Christ alone. And that access comes through the cross alone, through the blood of Christ alone. And so he goes on here and says, but not everyone knows this. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat such food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to an idol. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. Now here's a concept that is difficult, I think, for a lot of us. It's challenging for me to understand. Can something be sin for one person and not sin for another person. And I think Paul answers it right here. But food does not bring us near to God, for we are no worse if we do not eat, and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. And he's going to mention the fact that to one it is sinful, to the other it is not. And now here comes the real test of law. First of all, we need to understand a few things. Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not be your master, because you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? By no means. 
So in all of this process, I want to emphasize that I am not giving a green light to sinful behavior. But I'm going to talk about some things today that I think will raise concerns or questions in your mind. In Galatians 5.18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. Now everybody today, pretty much I think, understands legalism is bad. They say that. But they are naive or ignorant about what legalism is. Because they think, oh no, we're not under the law. But if they're living a life that believes, if I behave this way, God will do this. If I behave this way, God will do this. They are under legalism. God is not operating on a conditional relationship with believers today. And here comes the part that I'm going to focus on this morning. 1 Corinthians 6, 12, 13. Everything is permissible for me. What is not permissible? Nothing. There's nothing that's not permissible. In other words, what Paul's saying, what, what the professing church today just goes, oh, you can't say that to people. Don't say that. They'll believe you. You cannot say to people that you are totally free in Christ to do whatever you choose. Well, no, they, they would rather have you under the law, but you better not do this. I remember uh, this wasn't a big crime or anything, so don't think about it that way, but I had to go to federal court once, and uh, I was guilty. And so I didn't know what was going on. I was pretty naive. And I got there, and I went up to one of the marshals, and I said to him, could you answer a question for me? And he said, if I can, I'll be happy to. And I said, well, I'm guilty of what they charged me. He said, don't say that to me. <laughs> and I said, no, I, I did it. Don't, don't say that to me. <laughs> I was guilty. I knew it. It wasn't a big deal. But I wanted to find out what was going to happen. But he just didn't want to hear that. that well, I know before God I am totally guilty. There's no sense of trying to hide it or sugarcoat it or anything else. Apart from the salvation that is mine in Jesus Christ, I am totally guilty. I am totally depraved. People don't want to buy into that. They want to hang on to some little vestige of goodness in their life. So they're not totally indebted. That they have a little anchor, like that story, remember about the guy that didn't believe in God? And so he's walking along and he falls off his cliff and he grabs this branch on the way by and he's hanging off this precipice, a thousand foot drop, and he's yelling, help, help, is there anybody up there, help? No answer, so finally he says, God, if you're up there, help me. And a voice says, I thought you didn't believe in me. And he says, no, but I believe in you now. Help me, help me. And he says, will you trust me, son? He said, I'll do anything you ask. And he says, let go of the branch. And the guy said, is there anybody else up there? <laughs> That's sort of the way we are in our own nature. We don't want to own and admit what the Bible teaches. We want to hang on to something for ourselves. And so Paul says, everything is permissible for me. He can do anything he wants to. That's our freedom in Christ. That's what grace is all about. That's why Paul would not give in to a minute of anything that would try to shackle his believers under some type of legalism. Oh, you tell people that they're free like that, they're just going to head to the bars, they're going to start smoking, they're going to start fornicating, they're going to do all these terrible things. They don't understand the work of God in grace. Mm -hmm. But you can. You, you, you know, I used to do all this, but I can't do it anymore. Yes, you can. But it's not, as Paul goes on here, but everything is not beneficial. It's not good for you. Why do it if it's not good for you? And that's what the spirit's role is. 
to free you up so you can worship God totally from a free heart. Not out of any sense of, oh, I better do this or else. You're free. And God loves you that much that he gives you all your freedom. I remember growing up in, in high school and stuff and some couple would break up and the thing was, well, if they were truly yours, they'll return or something like that, like the butterfly that you turn loose. If it's really yours, it'll come back. Well, that is not the fear here. If we are God's, we will never leave him. We might disobey, we might rebel or anything else, but he will never release us. We belong to him. He bought us with a price. We are his possession. And he lets us be free. He, he, he doesn't trust us, but he knows his grace is able to take care of us. And so like the little saying goes, the will of God will never lead you where the grace of God can't keep you. And so as believers in Jesus Christ, everything's permissible, and Paul says it twice. You know, it's interesting that people used to, I've heard preachers say, you know, if the Bible says it, that's it. If it says it twice, that's really it. Well, Paul's going to say this four times. That's sort of like the modern day evolutionists and stuff trying to justify their things. They came up with a new one now. Well, if there's nothing and then there's really nothing, which is to defy creation, where God created the world out of nothing. But that isn't really nothing. It's just nothing. I mean, man comes up with all these thoughts. Here Paul says, everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. In other words, there is nothing in this world, in Paul's life, that he was desirous to have as a habit. It doesn't mean we can't enjoy the things. God's given us all things to enjoy. But nothing should become a habitual need, so to speak, in our life. Now, we're going to get to a concept of spirituality here that's beyond my spirituality and probably beyond most people's to the point where we say, well, who can do that? God. We can, but God can do it. And he can work in our lives, in grace, changing us changing our minds so that we will desire his things and not our own. Uh, the question has been asked many times, well, how far do you go not to offend a brother? I'm sorry, but you go as far as you have to by the grace of God, whatever that might be, if he's your brother in Christ. And so Paul goes on to explain here in 2 Corinthians 6, Food for the stomach and stomach for food, but God will destroy them both in the end. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And so Paul is explaining that all of this is about the fleshly realm and God is above all of it. And then in 1 Corinthians 10, 23, Everything is permissible for me, but everything is not beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is constructive. And it's important to understand that. What in your life, I have things in my life I know are not constructive. I pray, Lord, take it out of my life, and I go right back and do it again. Does that mean the Lord's not faithful? Not at all. It just means I am corrupt. He could take all of it out of every one of our lives instantly. And we wouldn't appreciate it. Much like Adam in the garden. Adam had everything. Everything that he ever needed was provided for him in the garden. And in the end, it wasn't enough. It didn't satisfy him. He was willing to disobey God to do something to satisfy himself and the woman that God had given him. And so everything is not constructive. 
So Paul goes on to say in verse 24, nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And so Paul takes this back to the food issue. But I believe he's talking about everything in our lives. Uh, again, it's important to understand that Paul also tells us in Galatians, and we'll go on these things again, but do not be deceived, for God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And if we sow to the flesh, we will reap corruption. If we sow to the Spirit, we'll reap eternal life. Now that doesn't mean that we will get saved or kept saved or something like that. It just means that we will reap the benefits of eternal life in our very existence at this time. So in Galatians 5.1, Paul writes, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. I think that in most of the teaching today, it's this concept of legalism. Don't get caught up in legalism. But what I think Paul is really talking about is don't get caught up in any thought, in any way, that you are some way earning God's favor by your behavior. He has already blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. God is not saying, oh, because you did this, I'm going to do this little bit extra for you. He desires us to have a heart bent on him and him alone. It's not our nature to do that. Our nature to its very core is about me and taking care of what I want in my carnal flesh. But the Spirit of God's working in me, showing me that God has another plan for my life that transcends this earthly existence for me. Even though I'm doing it in this body, on the earth, physically doing it, giving things to people, doing things with people, but it's the Spirit of God that's working in us to will and to do those things. And now it is me that's saying, well, like for example, I think it's almost laughable when you think about it. But I, I go to these church sales, you know. You don't find a lot of the best stuff there. It's outdated stuff. It's stuff that's old and used and everything else. And I'm not suggesting there's anything wrong with having a church sale and selling that stuff. But if I really were not attached to earthly things and I really believe that I'm doing this for God do you think he wants that old worn out pair of shoes or the brand new pair of sneakers <laughs> well he doesn't need either one of them but in our mind we're giving him what we don't want a sacrifice isn't a sacrifice unless it's a sacrifice it just makes sense But and so I find it sad sometimes there's stuff there that the trash wouldn't even accept and they found another way to get rid of it. <laughs> but that's, that's what I think is, but they're giving it to God and they have the concept like, well, just give them a little bit, help. God doesn't care about our physical stuff. He has a one concern for you. And having saved your soul, he now wants your life. But he doesn't demand it. He, in grace, saved your soul. He's working in grace to bring you to a place where you will give him 
your life. And so in Galatians 5.13, he says, you, my brothers, were called to be free. Everything's free for you. You can do whatever you want. But do not use your freedom to indulge a sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. In the dispensation of the grace of God, we have total freedom in everything. But that does not mean that we should be indifferent or neglectful concerning our choices. Even though everything is permissible, everything is not beneficial for us, everything is not constructive, and we should not be habitually attracted or attached to the things of this world. And so here's what Paul would recommend for us. In Colossians 1 verse, or Colossians 3 verse 1. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. That is one of the concepts that every believer in Jesus Christ as a member of the body of Christ should understand that your existence is in Christ, not in yourself. When God looks at you, he sees you in Christ. Now, he also sees us. He's not blind or anything like that. He sees what we're doing in everything. But that existence isn't how he relates to us. He relates to us in Christ. And in Christ Every believer is totally holy and without blame before him in love. And so there is no concern. You must really come to this place where you realize your salvation was totally by grace. That you deserve nothing from God but judgment. Instead, you got mercy and salvation by grace through faith. And so set your minds on the important things in your life, not in this world. Romans 12, 1 and 2. So here's, when your mind is set on the things above, here's what you're to do. Therefore I urge you, brother, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. In other words, present yourself if you've never done it. And this is an aorist tense verb, meaning do it once, get it done. Present yourself to God saying, Lord, here I am. I understand what you've done for me. And I don't any longer desire the things of this world to be my attraction. I really want your will and purpose for my life. But I can't do it, so I just give myself to you and trust you to do your will and purpose in me. And then leave it there. I don't suggest you don't do it. I do it repeatedly over and over again, acknowledging I'm yours, Lord. Do with me whatever you want. Glorify yourself in me and just walk by faith. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's your interaction between you and the Spirit of God with the Word of God, the Word of truth. Be transformed as your mind is renewed. Repentance will come and you will be transformed. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Verse six, uh, Romans 6, 13. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. 
At one time, Ephesians teaches us, we were all dead in trespasses and sins. But God, who is rich in mercy, wherewith with his great love, wherewith he loved us, he made us alive with Christ. He raised us up and seated us with him in the heavenly realm. He washed us up. He cleansed us from all of our sin. And he's working in us right now to will and to do of his good pleasure. And so don't beat yourself up thinking about who you are apart from Christ. But it's important to understand who you are apart from Christ so that when you succumb to your flesh and you see whatever it is that you didn't really want to do, but you did it, that you don't have a fear in the world because you were free to do that. And now God is desiring to teach you to plead with him, to pray to him, Lord, take this out of my life. I don't want to live this way. And then trust him because he doesn't just physically in this evil world, clean us all up and make us no, just perfect, so to speak. We are perfect in Christ spiritually. We are perfect in Christ in every way. But in ourselves, in this world, we're going to struggle until we're delivered from this natural self, this evil person that lives in this body. And so... God didn't change me. He's working in me to be different, to glorify him. And one day he's going to change me. One day he's going to give me a new body fashioned after the Lord's glorious body forever. And then I will be changed. Then I will be righteous. But till that day, I am unrighteous in myself I am righteous in Christ. And so we have a dual existence today. We have our physical existence in this world and our spiritual existence. And the spiritual existence is what Paul is focusing on. We're going to struggle throughout this life, but don't ever doubt that all of your sins have been washed away. You've been cleansed, you've been sanctified, in God's sight, you're already glorified. All we are is in the process. And one day we'll be there forever. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, what a glorious future awaits every member of the church, the body of Christ. An eternal future in heaven with you. And so we bow before you acknowledging you and you alone as our Savior and our God. We also acknowledge that in ourselves dwelleth no good thing. But you have taken up residence in our lives. And we thank you for it. I pray that each person that hears this message will be taught by your spirit to trust, to have faith, to believe that the Spirit of God is working in them to glorify you until that day. And so, Heavenly Father, we give you all the praise and the thanks. Only you are worthy. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.